Let's talk about the Alara apartment disaster. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Heiser Says. One good thing about the Opal Tower and all the issues surrounding it is that it's bringing light to the construction industry. People are starting to talk about it. Stuff that you'd usually only, only talk about with other professionals and bitch and moan over a few drinks at an event is now being discussed by the media and the public are aware of it. One thing this is really very important, all of this, is the fact that it's about consumer protection. And as I've said in previous videos, I'm looking with my mother at apartments and I'm sending all these articles to her to steer her to older stock. So let's have a read through this article about the Alara Apartments in Canberra. And this is, this is really sad, actually. So the Alara apartment owners lose a federal court compensation bid. Okay, that's, it's $19 million. A group of Canberra apartment owners facing $19 million in repairs for shoddy building work has been dealt another blow, losing a federal court bid to claim compensation. The Alara apartment complex, built in 2007, so not that long ago, on a prime block of land in Bruce, has been haunted by a web of problems with the development and failed legal action. So this is in Canberra. For those of you that are from overseas, it's the, the capital of our wonderful country here. Last year, the ABC re revealed the plight of Alara apartment owners who said the apartments were beset with leaks and other problems and tried to sue Canberra builder B&T Constructions. They, the builders, subsequently went into voluntary administration. So the builders burned the company rather than, rather than stump up. The group then lodged claims with the Master Builders Fidelity Fund, which was set up in 2002 to compensate those who could not sue their builder. Compensation was capped at 85000 per owner, which isn't very much when you're talking about rectification work on an apartment building. But claims had to be made within five years from uh, May 25th, 2007. So that was probably when, was that, that was when the building was built. That seems odd. The first claim to the fund was not lodged until August 2017. That seems odd. Okay. I would. I always thought that claims have to be made within a period of time from when the defects were first identified. So if they were identified then, in 2007, right near when it was built, that could make sense. And uh, But how many consumers, just adding my spin on this, how many consumers are really aware of these type of things? Well, uh, is it a, does it need, do we need to have requirements for when you're buying an apartment that you're handed a sheet going, this, 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 this is when you can claim, or defects have been noted on the property at this point here, 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 they've been rectified here. Does this information need to be captured and handed over during the due diligence process of when someone is buying an apartment? Or when someone is doing an inspection, is that required? The funds rejected the application because they were lodged outside the five-year deadline, a decision upheld by the federal court yesterday. The apartment owners alleged the work performed by the builder was not carried out in a proper and skillful way and with good and proper materials. Oh. Consequently, defects exist in the common property, load-bearing walls, balconies, and utility services. The cost of rectifying the defects is estimated at more than $19 million which is only slightly less than the cost of the initial project. That, that just puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Right there. Then maybe cheaper to restart and rebuild. Then you have no defects. But Justice John Griffiths rejects the claims because they did not arise within the time period. So they didn't arise within the time period. So there you go. Do we need to change these time period requirements. How long should a building last? How long should an apartment last? When we were working on mining buildings, they had to be designed for 25 years and built. In my view, there is no obligation on the trustees of the fund to pay an amount to the applicant even where a valid request or claim has been made, Justice Griffith said. The trustees have a discretion in the matter, not only as to whether to pay any amount at all, but also to the actual amount which might be paid subject to the relevant cap. So the best they could have gotten was the 85 grand each, and it's just completely up to the trustees. 
Justice Griffiths stated the claims themselves were not submitted within the time period set out in the relevant legislation or within the currency of any of the uh, fidelity certificates of Alara. The fidelity certificates are not an independent or isolated source of enforceable legal rights and obligations. He said the period of cover under the uh, fidelity fund scheme expired in May 26, 2012, being one day and uh, being one day after the five-year period following the issue of a certificate of occupancy for each unit. Okay, so that scheme only lasts. It's from the the certificate of occupancy, not from when the defects were discovered. Hmm. That I don't like that. I understand why it exists, but I don't like it. What do you think, guys? Those of you in the comments, do you think that's that's reasonable? Should that be changed? Should it be from when a defect is found? Hmm. Particularly if it's if it's claimed from shoddy workmanship. In the particular circumstances here, the builder did not become insolvent until 20th of July 2017, which is well outside the period of covers, he said. It matters not that the loss referred to crystallized within the period of cover. This is no relevance unless the condition specified also crystallized within that time. Okay. The second claim, which was submitted even later than the first, was rejected on the same basis. The owners were also ordered to pay the respondents' costs as agreed or assessed. So they're copying it a lot. So they bought these, this building, and I mean, look, look at the, these issues here. Look at these issues. It is just not a robust construction. It, it's, it's wearing out really quick. We'd bought a lemon. David Allen, who bought an apartment in 2012, told the ABC last year that problems within the complex began to arise immediately. So he bought it in 2012. He bought it five years after it was built. Five years after it was built. We were looking at a place for my daughter to stay, and it was perfect, just across the road from the University of Canberra, he said. Less than a month after buying, the unit's problem started to mount. We bought a lemon. How foolish were we? A second man who the ABC called John also noticed red flags and reported the rep problems to the property manager. A lot of the early signs were that, yes, we'll get onto this straight away. We'll come and fix this, John said. But things did, not, uh, did seem to drag on for quite some time, a lot longer than they really should. Eventually, the owners commissioned an expert report into the building's defects. It found highly corrosive water leaking onto car park paintwork throughout the basement and water of serious structural and fire safety risks. Oh, oh no. It also alleged some balconies were at risk of collapse, a claim that the ACT government took so seriously it ordered B&T Constructions to install propping to support the structure. That is crazy. The company initially complied but removed some, of, some a few months later without approval, citing their own report claiming the risks were exaggerated. In the meantime, other problems festered, according to waterproofing expert Ross Taylor. There are about 12 categories of is issues. Roofs, walls, bathroom leaking, balcony leaking, basement leaking, and structural issues. I'll read this quote. The scale and complexity of the issues at Lara are amongst the worst I've come across in 40 years, Mr. Taylor said. Wow. Wow. Look, look, at, look at this damage going right up here. Owners would find themselves battling against rapidly molding walls and cracking ceilings. An initial estimate put the repair costs above $19 million, though the owners say that number continues to rise. So, the Opal Tower may have brought it all to the forefront, to the news, particularly because when it happens, but, I mean, look at this. Look at the issues they're having in this building. You know, th these are, are defects that should have been caught right at the beginning, and rectified. You know, it got a COC, a certificate of occupancy or certificate of classification, depending on what state you're in. And look at these issues. These are these are life safety issues. So I thought I would share this all with you, so you're really aware that this is happening more and more. And to kind of get the discussion going, let me know what you think. Do you, do you think it's fair that the um, 
the requirements for this discretionary or the trustees is set from the certificate of the certificate of occupancy, not from the date the fir the defects were discovered. You know, do we need to change this? Do we need to have better consumer protection for people? So yeah, it, it's I feel quite sad for him to be honest. It's it must be a nightmare. So guys. Thank you all for joining me for this episode. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Like, share, and subscribe, and ding the bell to see my daily updates. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Bye for now. <laughs>